edges to the sky Your eyes shakes It's like somebody melted Yeah Your justice flows Like the ocean's side I will live
Good to see you guys all here this morning. Sleepy, rainy Saturday morning. You all got up and out of bed and came on in as we continue through Joshua. You know, I recently heard a story. A pastor uh, was in the middle of his teaching on uh, Sunday morning, and right in the middle, one of his men got up and walked out and never came back in. And so he was concerned after service. He looked up and he couldn't find him. He found his wife. He said, hey, uh, I hope I didn't say anything to offend your husband. I saw he walked out. She goes, oh, no, don't worry about him. He's not offended. He just has a problem with sleepwalking. <laughs> See, that'll, sneak, that'll sneak up on you. <laughs> so on this uh, rainy morning, stay with me the best you can, all right? Uh, I thought we might, uh, I might go to, when I was preparing this, might go to Joshua 12. Uh, and and hey, this, has been a, this has been a good year in Joshua, hasn't it? Yes. Joshua is a rich book. I mean, we probably could stay in Joshua for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> let's just pray as, before we get started. Lord, we just ask you this morning that you would teach us what you want us to learn and you would make us what you want us to be by the power of your holy word and we thank you in jesus name amen joshua chapter 12 and when i started out uh preparing this i thought okay we'll go to verse one and two and these are the kings of the land whom the children of israel defeated and whose land they possessed on the other side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun uh, from the river Arnon to Mount he uh, Hermon. In all the eastern Jordan plain, one king was Sion, king of the Amorites. Oh, we'll go to verse 4. And the other king was Og. And verse 8, in the mountain country, in the lowlands, in the uh, Jordan plain, in the slopes, in the wilderness, and in... Uh, the south, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I'll go to, king, to verse 9, we'll see a discussion on the king of Jericho. In verse 10, the king of Jerusalem, and I'm thinking, oh, lists, lists. This is just one list, one, per, one person after another. And, and that, so I thought, okay, well, let's jump over to Joshua 13, verse 1. And now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. And Joshua was probably saying, did you have to bring that up again? And there remains very much land yet to be possessed. This is the land that yet remains. All the territory, you know, oh no, we have another list here. List after list after list. Ah, okay, we'll go over to Joshua 14. And these are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, oh, another list. List after list. You know, really, if you go from chapter 12 right on up to 20, with a few exceptions, it's just one list after another after another. And, you know, we have a, we have a tendency sometimes to want to skip over these lists. We don't know these people, and we don't know these places. We're not very familiar with them. And just like in uh, Genesis, long lists. Of, of people there. First, in First Chronicles, there's one. Matthew goes through a long list. There are 133 begots in there. And, you know, we kind of get bogged down. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm going to skip on to something else. Well, you know, the thing that, that we need to realize is that lists, these lists are important to God. Revelation 20, verse 12 says, The books were opened, and the dead were judged according to their own works by the things which were written in the books. Now, that book might be kind of boring until we come across our own name. That would, that would pep things up a bit, wouldn't it? Listen, the truth is, if it's written down, it's important to God. Ninety-six times the phrase, some form of the phrase, it is written, is used 
Uh, Jesus used it over and over again. The apostles used it, referring back to the Old Testament. It is written, it is written, it is written. Now, there are plenty of nuggets to be found in some of these lists. Uh, for instance, Joshua 12:4. Uh, the other king was Og, the king of Bashan, in his territory, who was of the remnant of the giants who dwelt in Ashtaroth and Andrea. This little nugget here supports the fact that there were actually giants. We find other discussions of giants in the land back in those days, and this supports, uh, supports that, and there's a lot of things that we can find in those lists. The, a study of these lists, especially here in Joshua, would be long and detailed and require a lot of time, which doesn't really serve our purpose very well here in Ironworks. We'd be in Judges, for, or we'd be in Joshua for the next five years. <clears throat> but there were three things that stood out to me when I looked at these lists, and those three things are people, people groups, and borders or boundaries. Over and over again, we see individual people's names, people groups, and their borders and boundaries. He's very meticulous to describe the boundary where it starts here and it runs over to the sea and it runs in, and that's, that's a very important thing. Now, we, we live in, a, in an, an era today where there's so many people that want borderless societies. Well, I can guarantee you that that kind of thinking doesn't come from God. Borders and boundaries are important to God. And we want to take a look at maybe why they're important. It prompt, the Holy Spirit prompted me to take a look at something that Paul said in Acts 17. So let's jump over there to Acts 17. Paul, in Acts 17, had the opportunity to speak to the men of Athens. And uh, he spoke at the Areopagus. It's a huge rock. If you look it up, you can see it on the internet. It's, it's still there today. And it's be like if we all decide to go up to, to Table Rock and have a, have a men's meeting at Table Rock. It, I mean, I'm more comfortable in here if it's okay with you guys. But, but it's a huge rock. And these men used to gather there and discuss the issues of the day. And here, uh, Paul very brilliantly zeroes in on the unknown God. They, he saw a monument to the unknown God as the Athenians were apparently trying to cover all the bases. And while proclaiming the unknown God, he was pro proclaiming his God, the God of the Jews, he describes his God, the God that they don't know. In Acts 17, 24 through 27, Paul says, and God who made the world and everything in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. I would say that's a pretty good description of God in two quick sentences, is it not? Acts 17, 26. And he has made from one blood, or it could be translated one man, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. That pretty much shoots holes through some of the uh, silly racial ideas that existed in our country and many places around the world. We were all made from one blood, one man, and, and we became uh, nations of men that dwell all over the face of the earth. He has determined... Now, catch this. this is, Paul's building to this truth. He has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. Boundaries or borders are important to God. Our time on earth, where we live, is appointed by God. It's important to God. Why? Verse 27. So that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I don't know how many times I've read through the book of Acts and just skipped right over that word, grope. And I thought, wow, I wonder what he's trying to say here. You know, I looked the word up. You know what it means? It means grope. It means like a blind man 
going down the hallway, feeling his way, trying to find the next door. And he says here, what this verse is telling us is God, in his sovereign purposes, places us in a time and a location to make it possible that we might find him by groping. Now you're all looking at me like he's going to really go off the deep end this morning, isn't he? And that's the way I kind of looked at it. I was groping, groping. What's he talking about? Well, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I realized men generally do not set out on a crusade to find God or to find salvation. There may be exceptions. I don't know of any. Most of us find him by setting out to disprove him. Like Lee Strobel wrote the case for Christ. He was an attorney. And he set out, when his wife got saved, he set out to prove that it was all just a made-up fairy tale and that Christ didn't exist and the whole gospel is made up. And in his process, as he groped with his blinded spiritual eyes through life, Christ one day manifested himself to him and he was gloriously saved. And today, he's a very strong testimony for the Lord. Now, the truth is, isn't that really how most of us find Christ? Spiritually blinded, blind spiritual eyes, groping for happiness, for peace, for meaning, for joy, for satisfaction. Men often seek the benefits without the giver of the benefits. A good example is a rich young ruler. He comes and says, what must I do to, be, to have eternal life? And he was interested in answer to that question until he realized it was going to cost him something. Now I'm going to take a couple of minutes and give you, give you a little bit of a personal testimony. You know, I, I, I know you've had bits and pieces of this as long as I've been teaching here. Uh, <clears throat> I grew up in a relatively conservative Pennsylvania Dutch area of the country. Uh, there was a lot of Brethren in Christ churches around where I grew up, a lot of what we used to call Dunkard, Mennonite, uh, uh, there was some Amish, and a lot of Lutheran. My family uh, came out of the Lutheran, the old Lutheran church in Germany, came to America. And the, the problem was by the time I came along in the 50s and 60s, our church was no longer the Reformed Lutheran. It became a United Church of Christ, which had long since departed from the idea that the Word of God was infallible and that the Bible was true from cover to cover. And so, consequently, we heard a lot about Bible stories. I heard all about David and Goliath and Saul and, and, uh, and, and Paul, and uh, so I knew a lot about those Bible stories, but they really hadn't, didn't have any meaning for me because... I didn't have the Holy Spirit inside me teaching me. And I remember there was actually, it was a teenager. Uh, my family was very faithful of that church. I mean, I got people buried in that cemetery from back in the 1700s. And uh, so we were there all the time. But I remember one day a, a, a teenage guy came to visit a new guy, and he, carried, he brought his Bible with him when he came to church. And we all kind of snickered and laughed. What's the guy bringing a Bible to church for? We got him in the pews, right? You know? And so that was sort of, sort of the attitude that I grew up in. Try to do more good things than bad things, and the scale's going to balance out, and you'll be okay, and you'll get to heaven. Well, by the time I got to be 18, 17, 18, my scale was tipped a little too hard to the bad side. And I just decided that fast, hot cars and copious amounts of uh, adult beverages were going to be more beneficial to me than spending a lot of time in church where I was not benefiting or not growing. And I'm not blaming those people. I'm blaming I had the same Bible laying on the table at home as, as what, what they did. And so it's not their fault. It was my fault. But I went through a long period of time where I just would not darken the door of a church. And I remember during that time, I used to occasionally, back in those days, Billy Graham was doing televised uh, evangelistic crusades. And I would often, when I found out that he was going to be on TV, I would take the time 
to just sit down and listen to Billy Graham. And I had a lot of respect for Billy Graham. And, and I remember saying, I probably said it to myself and I probably said it to other people, that thing that he's talking about, that business about getting saved, I would probably do that if somebody explained to me how to do it. And as, as I'm thinking that, I'm popping the top on another cold uh, can of adult beverage and, and just continuing to grope through life, finding, looking for the things that make me happy and not really concerned about where I can find true happiness. I liked, I had some respect for the benefits that came from knowing God, but I was not ready to make the commitment. The day I came to Christ, I didn't go to church that morning thinking, I've got to get in there and find out the truth. I need to find God. Maybe I can find him here. No, I was going there because my wife wanted to go there. I was making her happy. Okay, we were invited by, by another family, uh, a family who used to be a drinking friend of mine, and he got saved, and all of a sudden his life completely turned around. And his wife made friends with my wife, and so we got talked into coming, church, coming to church. And here I find myself in this gospel-preaching church that I had never heard these truths before, never heard it like I was hearing it from that, that pastor. And I just, uh, be honest with you, I didn't go there with the intention of anything other than just make my wife happy. And when I came to the point where I'm finding myself walking down the aisle, there's a part of me that's going, what are you doing? And there's another part of me that was saying, just shut up and keep on going. I got a plan for you here. And, and you know, I found myself drawn that morning to go down front and deal with the counselor there about my salvation. I was drawn to the truth. And I, and I responded to his counsel. I, I gave my life to Christ, and my life was radically changed. Radically changed. People that knew me were like, what? He got religion? Come on, you know? <clears throat> I remember that my, my wife asked me on the way home from church that day. She said, are you going to drink anymore? And I said, well, pfft. I don't know, it didn't ever come to my mind. It wasn't an issue. But the truth is, God changed me day by day by day, where that was no longer a part of my life. I was drawn to the truth. And the Holy Spirit allowed me to respond to the truth, and it radically changed me. Let's look at some verses and what the Bible says about this process that we're talking about. Of course, we saw in Acts 26 and 27 where he sets our times and our, our boundaries so that we seek and grope for him. Now, let me just qualify this and say, I'm not saying that God puts you in a, in a certain place and you can't ever move from there. God's in control. He's sovereign over all that kind of thing. We lived a number of different places in our, year, year, in our life, but I've looked back and I find that God is in each one of those moves, in each one of those places. But we see that he puts us in places and even sets us in times, and his purpose is that we seek him and we grope for him. Acts 15 is an example, Acts 15, 16, and 17. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Paul is quoting there Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. And what he is telling us there is salvation is of the Lord. It is not of men in any way, shape, or form. Salvation is the Lord. We are those Gentiles who are called by his name. And God did a thing there that was going to continue his testimony and be able, the truth would be able to reach us in times in the future. Isaiah 56, I'm sorry, 55 in verse 6. 
Isaiah said, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Well, it's our former verses said that he, when we come to Christ, we find out that he was near, near us all along. There was many opportunities before I became a Christian where I may, maybe did, wouldn't have lived through some of the stuff that I went through. And yet, I look back and I realize God was with me all along. He's preserving me for a purpose. Isaiah said, we should seek him while he may be found. I mean, we often use that verse to say that God may not always seek after you if you continue to resist him. But the truth is, he's telling us there to seek him. And yet, there's a lot of other verses here that say we're going to have trouble seeking him because of of the way we are. Romans 10, 20. Here Paul was quoting Isaiah 65, 1. He said, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest by those who did not ask for me. That was me that Sunday morning in church. I didn't go there to find God, but I found him because he found me and, and, uh, and changed my life on the spot. What's he telling us there? Salvation is of the Lord. John six forty four. Jesus said, no man, no one, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. We can't even come to Jesus unless the Holy Spirit, and he says here, the Father, unless the Father draws us to himself. He's telling us salvation is of the Lord. Acts 13, 48, Paul and Barnabas turn away from the The Jews are rejecting them and turn to the Gentiles. And it says, now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Appointed. That word is tasso. It means to be ordained, to place in a certain order, to arrange, to appoint. Now, some may be listening to this this morning or sometime in the future and go, well, that guy's a Calvinist. He's talking about Calvinism there. Well, let's make an agreement here, guys. Let's refrain from attaching any man's name to these verses, and let's just let the Bible say what it says. It says that we were appointed to salvation, and and we're going to see in another couple of verses long, long before we ever lived. Salvation is of the Lord. Now we have a couple of takeaways in, uh, from this teaching. Psalm 119, 140 says, Your word is pure, therefore your servant loves it. The Bible, the words of God are pure. They're like refined gold. They're of great value and they're pure. All of them, even the boring parts, even the long lists, even the uninteresting parts. Those things are important to God or he wouldn't have had them written down for us. And they need to become important to us. Another takeaway, God goes to great lengths to bring us to himself. He sets our time. He sets our boundaries where we live. He makes our paths straight. He chooses our time and our dwelling place. He calls us even while we are groping for all the things that we think we will make us happy, and yet we find in the end it was God. It was, it was the only Jesus. It was the only thing that could really make us happy and bring us joy. Second Timothy 1, 8 and 9. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, not of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus when we got saved? No, it's not what it says. Before time began, long before we came to Christ, long before we ever drew a breath, long before Christ paid our price on the cross, It says that grace was given to us before time began. It was part of the eternal purpose of God. His purpose, 
is calling out a people for his name. And thank the Lord we are part of that if we have received him as our Savior and had our sins forgiven. And I pray that's your situation. If you're here with us this morning or you're listening online, salvation is of the Lord. That's a big takeaway today. We can't take credit for anything, any of it. Alistair Begg, uh, pastor of Parkside Church in Cleveland, Ohio, puts it like this, and I'll, I'll paraphrase what he said. Whenever we're questioned about how we're getting to heaven, how we're going to get into heaven, we should never answer in the first person. Like, well, I was baptized. I walked down an aisle. I professed my faith in Christ. We should always answer it in the third person because he died in my place, because he called me to salvation, because he set me apart. And he illustrates it with a, a, a kind of a humorous story about the thief on the cross when he got to heaven. And one of the angels may have questioned him and said, what are you here for? And he says, well, I don't know. And he says, well, what do you know about the, the Bible, the Word of God? And he says, nothing. And he says, well, what qualifies you to come in, come in here with us in heaven? And he says, I don't know. How did you get here? And he says, all I know is the man on the middle cross said I could come. That's a profound statement. His story would have been, we were all dying. I knew I deserved it. I believed he didn't deserve it. He said he was coming into a kingdom and I simply asked him, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And he said, I could come. That's a, that's a beautiful truth there, isn't it? Christ placed that man in a period of time and in a place where he would grope his way and find salvation. Did he go to the execution, uh, to, the, to, the, to the cross to be executed that morning, figuring that he was going to find salvation? No, I don't think that's the way the day started out for him. But he found him. He groped his way to God and realized when, the, when the, the Christ was there right beside him that this was the truth that I need to respond to. He groped his way and found salvation just like you and just like I did. Now again, let me, let me just say that I know there are maybe some folks that have a little bit different experience. Uh, there are some folks who got saved when they were a child had a very, very uh, different experience. But I think for the most part, we end up groping our way towards God with blinded spiritual eyes looking for everything but Jesus to make us happy. And yet he graciously reveals himself to us. I'm going to end up with, uh, with this few verses from Isaiah. We don't have those on the board Brian, I just added these last night late, so <laughs> didn't want to bother you that late at night. But, I, but it caught my eye as I was looking through verses uh, that pertain to this subject. Isaiah 59, 9. Therefore, justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness, for, bright, for brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as if it was night, twilight. We growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none, for salvation, but it is far from us. That's us. The prophet there is describing, describing the human condition. We'll go down, skip down to verse 15, the second part. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. 
he saw that there was no man and wondered that there were no there was no intercessor therefore his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness it sustained him verse 20 says the redeemer will come to zion and those who turn from transgression to jacob that's our god he is our he is our redeemer he saw our condition even before we were born, before time began, and he did something about it. He is our redeemer. Listen, guys, he loves us. He provides the way for us. He calls us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Father, we, we thank you for this wonderful truth. And, Lord, we ask you to help us today in small groups to really share our story and appreciate what you have done for us. And, and, and we just love you, Lord. And we just don't have a better way to say it. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you in your holy name.